The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Okay, so uh, this is a big day. Part one of the course is completed. And I have your quizzes for you, and that was a very successful result. I'm very pleased. I hope you are too. Um, quiz average of 85. That's on the first part of the course. And then the second part, so this is sex chapter three now, uh, starts with one dimension with an equation of a type that we've already seen a little bit. At, so there's some, some more things to say about the equation and the framework, but then uh, we get to make a start on the finite element approach to solving it. We could, of course, in 1D, finite differences are probably the way to go, actually. Uh, in one dimension, uh, the, the special um, success of finite elements doesn't really show up that much because finite elements have have been, I mean, one great reason for their success is the, that they handle different geometries. They're flexible. You could have regions in the plane, three-dimensional bodies of different shapes. Finite differences doesn't really know what to do at a curved boundary in, uh, in 2 or 3D. Uh, finite elements copes much better. So we'll make a start today, more tomorrow or Friday on one-dimensional finite elements, and then a, a, a couple of weeks later uh, will be the real thing, 2D and 3D. Okay, so ready to go on chapter three? So that's our equation, and everybody sees right away what's the, the framework, that that's A transpose. In some way, this is A transpose CA, but what's new, of course, is that we're dealing with functions, not vectors. So we're de dealing with, you could say, operators, not matrices. And nevertheless, the big picture is still as it was. So let me take u of x to be the displacements again. So I'm thinking more of mechanics than uh, electronics here. Displacements, and then we have du, the e of x will be du dx. That'll be the stretching the elongation, and of course, at that step, you already see the big new item, that the fact that the A, the one that gets us from U to du dx, instead of being a difference matrix, which it has been, our matrix A, is now a derivative. A is d by dx. So that's, we haven't, Maybe I'll just take out that arrow so you. So A is d by dx now. Okay. Uh, so that's, but it, if we dealt okay with difference matrices, we're going to deal okay with derivatives. Then, of course, this is, be, this is the, the C part that produces W of x, and it's a multiplication by this, this uh, possibly varying, possibly jumping. Uh, stiffness constant C of x. So W of x is C of x, E of x. That's our old W equals C, E. This is Hooke's law. I, I, I'll put Hooke's law, but that's, or whosoever law it is. We've got a, it, it's like a diagonal matrix. I hope you see that it's like a diagonal matrix. U, this function U is kind of like a, a, a vector, but a continuous, a continuum vector instead of just fixed finite number of values. Then at each value we used to multiply by ci. Now our values have, are continuous with a x, so we multiply by c of x. And then you've got, you're going to expect that going up here there's going to be an a transpose wf. And of course, that a transpose we have to identify, and that's the first point of the lecture, really. 
to identify what is a transpose. What do I mean by a transpose? And I better say right away that you never, I, uh, that I'm a little, uh, the notation, writing a transpose of a derivative is like, that's not legal. You know, it's not sort of, because we think of the transpose of a matrix, you sort of flip it over uh, the main diagonal, but obviously that's not, there's got to be something more to it than that. And so that's a, a central key, math part of this lecture is what is, what's really going on when you transpose? Because then we can copy what's going on, and it's quite important to get it because this, the transpose, while well, other notations and other words for it would be, uh, a notation might be a star. Star is, would be way more common than transpose. I, I'll just stay with transpose because I want to keep pressing the parallel with A transpose CA. But, and, and the name for it would be the adjoint. And, the, and adjoint methods, an adjoint operator, those, those appear a lot. And you'll see them appear in finite elements. So this is, this is a, a good, good, bit, good thing to catch on to. Why, why should the, the, the transpose or the adjoint of the derivative be minus the derivative? And by the way, just while we're fixing this, this is a key fact then, uh, which, which is certainly like we have a very strong hint from centered differences, right? If I, if I think of derivatives, if I associate them with differences, the centered difference matrix, so the A matrix may be centered, would be just, just to remind us, you know, it's a center difference has ones and minus one, one, zeros on the diagonal, right? Minus one, one, takes that difference at every, at every uh, row, except possibly boundary rows. And, and of course, as soon as you look at that matrix, you see, yeah, it's anti-symmetric. That's an anti-symmetric matrix. So A transpose is minus A for the for center differences, and therefore we're not so surprised to see a minus sign appear when we go to the continuous case, the derivative. But we still have to say what it means. What, uh, 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 and so that's what I'll do next. Okay. So this is a good thing to know, and I was just going to comment, what would be the transpose of the second derivative? Just, I won't even write this down. If the transpose of the, if the derivative transpose sort of flips its sign to minus, what would be, what would you guess for the sec transpose of second derivative, our more familiar d second by dx squared? Well, we'll have two minus signs, so it'll come out plus. So that, so second derivatives, even order derivatives are sort of like symmetric guys. Odd order derivatives, first and third and fifth derivatives, well, God forbid we ever meet a fifth derivative, but fir first derivative anyway, uh, is uh, anti-symmetric, except for boundary conditions. So I really have to emphasize that the boundary conditions come in, and, and you'll see them come in, and they have to come in. Okay, so how, what meaning can I assign to the transpose, or, or what's the, what, you know, what was the real, real thing happening when we flipped a matrix across its diagonal? I claim that the real, the, the, we, we really define the transpose by this rule. By, we know what inner products are. I, I'll do vectors first. We know what inner products, dot products. We know what the dot product of two vectors is. So, uh, so if I have a, ma this is the transpose of A. How am I going to define the transpose of A? Well, I look at the dot product of A, U with W. I'll use a dot here for once, and then I may erase it and replace it. If I, if I look at the dot product of A, U with W, then that equals, for all u and w, all vectors u and w, that equals the dot product of u with something. Because it just, 
u is coming if I write out what the dot product is. I see u1 multiplies something, u2 multiplies something, and that's, and what do I, what, what goes in that little space? This is just an identity. I mean, it's like you'll say, no, no big deal. But I'm saying there is a, at least a small deal here. Okay, so uh, 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 now, uh, uh, if I write it this way, you'll tell me right away, this should be the same as u transpose times something. And again, so I'm asking for the same something on both, both lines. What is that something? A transpose W. Whatever A transpose is, it's the matrix that makes this right. That's really my message. That A transpose is, it, the, the reason we flip the matrix across the diagonal is that it makes that equation correct. And, it, and, and, and I'm writing the same thing here. Okay. So again, if we knew what dot products were, what, what inner products of vectors were, then A transpose is the, is the matrix that makes this identity correct. And of course, if you, if you write it all out in terms of ij, every component, you find it is correct. Okay, so that defines the transpose of a matrix. And, it, and of course, it coincides with flipping across the diagonal. Now, how about the transpose of der a derivative? Okay, so I'm going to follow the same rule. I, here A is now going to be the derivative, and A transpose is going to be whatever it takes to make this true. But what do I mean? Now I have functions, so I have to think again, what do I mean by the inner product, the dot product? So I need, for this to make sense, I, I need to say, and it's a very important thing anyway, and it's the right natural choice, I need to need, uh, I need to say, the dot product or the inner product is a better word of functions of two functions, say e of x and w of x. If I have two functions, what do I mean by their inner product? Well, I just really I just think back. What did I? What did we mean in the in the finite dimensional case? I multiplied each e by a w, each component of the e by a w, and I added. So what am I going to do here? And I, maybe my notation should be this with, should be parentheses with a comma would be better than a dot, I think, for functions. So those are, I have a function. I'm in function space now. You know, we're move, we moved out of Rn today into function space. Our, our vectors have become functions. And now what's the dot product of two vectors? Well, what, do you, what, what am I going to do? You, you can, I, I'm, got, I'm gonna do what I have to do. I'm gonna multiply each E by each W, by its corresponding W, and now they depend on this continuous variable X, and now what am I, so that's E of X times W of X, and what do I do now? Integrate. Integrate. Here I added EI times WI, of course. Over here, I have functions, I integrate dx over whatever the region of the problem is. And in our examples in 1D, it'll be 0 to 1. If, if these are functions of two variables, I'd be integrating over some 2D region, but we're in 1D today. Okay, so now I'm, you see that I'm like prepared to say, this, this now makes sense. This, this, I, I now want to, Mike still going? Yeah, okay. Uh, I, I now want to say, uh, I want, I'm going to let A be the derivative, I'm, and I'm going to figure out what A transpose has to be. So if A is the derivative, so, so now I'm going to, now is this key step. Why is the transpose that? Okay, so I look at the derivative, du dx with w, so that's this integral from 0 to 1 of du dx, w of x dx. And now I want to, so that's my left side. Now I want to get u by itself. 
I want to get the dot, dot product, so I want to get another integral here that has u of x by itself times, times something, and that something is what I'm looking for. That something will be A transpose W, right? Right? You, do you see what I'm doing? This is, an, this is the dot product. This is AUW. So I've wrote, written out what AU inner product with W is. And now I want to get U out by itself. And what it multiplies here will be the A transpose W. And my rule will be, will be extended to the function case. And I'll be ready to go. Now, do you recognize this is a basic calculus step? What, a, what, what rule of calculus am I, am I going to use? We're back to 1801. I have the integral of a derivative times w, and what do I want to do? I want to get the derivative off of u. What happens? What's it called? Integration by parts. Very important thing. Very important. If I, you, you miss its importance in, in, in calculus. It gets sometimes introduced as a rule or a trick to find some goofy integral, but it's, it's really the real thing. So what is integration by parts? What's the rule? You, you take the derivative off of, of u, you put it onto the other one, just what we hope for, and then you also have to remember that there is a minus sign, right? Integration by parts has a minus sign. And let me, usually you'd see it out there, but here I've left more room for it there, dx. So I have identified now a transpose w. A transpose w had, if this is a u in a product with w, then, and th then this is u in a product with a transpose w, it had to be what it was. And so that one integration by parts brought out a minus sign. If I was looking at second derivatives, there would probably be somewhere two integration by parts. I'd have minus twice, I'd be back to plus. And you're going to ask about boundary conditions. And you're right to ask about boundary conditions. I even circled that because it's, that it's so important. So what we've done so far is sort of to get the interior of the interval right. W inside, between 0 and 1, if A is the derivative, then A transpose is minus the derivative. That's, that's all we've done. We have not got the boundary conditions yet. And, and that, we, ca we can't go on without that. Okay, so, so I'm ready now to say something about boundary conditions. And it will bring up this square versus rectangular also. So this is, this is a good, this is like, we're, we're getting the kind of the rules straight before we tackle finite elements. <coughs> okay, let me take an example of a matrix and its transpose, just so you see how boundary can, suppose I have Suppose I have a free fixed problem. Suppose I have a free fixed line of springs. What's the matrix A for that? Question. Well, yeah, question? Yes. Isn't that what it is? Yeah, right. That's, sorry, that's, yes. When I learned it, it was also that <laughs> stupid <laughs> term. So you would like me to put plus. Can I put plus whatever? What do you want me to call that? An integrated term? It would be, yeah, why don't I even say, I even remember what it is, as you do better than me. U times W at the, at the, is that good? Yeah, thank you, sorry, sorry, yeah, 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 yeah. So it's really this part that I'm now coming to. It's the boundary part that I'm now coming to. And, uh, and let me say, so I, I you, I'm glad you asked the question because I made it seem unimportant where that's not true at all. The boundary condition is part of the definition of A and part of the definition of A transpose. Just the way I'm about to say free fixed, I had to tell you that for you to know what A was. If I, until I tell you the boundary condition, you don't know what the boundary rows are. You don't know, you only know the inside of the matrix or one possible inside. So I'm thinking my inside is going to be minus 1, 1, minus 1, 1, so on as a, as a, as a, 
giving me finite differences, minus 1, 1. But what, so, oh no, let's see. So I'm doing free fixed. Is that right? Am I doing free fixed? Okay. Okay, so I'm taking free, am I taking free at the left end? Yes, all right. So, so if I'm free at the left end and fixed at the right end, what's my A? You, uh, we, we're getting better at this, right? Uh, minus 1, 1, minus 1, 1, minus 1, 1, minus 1, and the 1 here gets chopped off. That we, you could say, if you want, the fifth row of A naught. Remembering A naught as the hint on the quiz, where it had five rows for the full thing, three free, and then when an N got fixed, the fifth column, sorry, I should say, fifth column got, got removed, and that's my fix, free fixed matrix. At the left-hand end, at the zero end, it's got the difference in there, difference, 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 but here at the right-hand end, it's the, the fixing, the setting U, whatever it would be, U5 to zero, or maybe it's U4. If this is U0, 1, 2, 3, setting U4 to zero, knock that out. Okay. I, all I want to do is transpose that. And you'll see something you may that we maybe didn't notice before. So I transpose it, that's minus 1, 1 becomes a column, minus 1, 1 becomes a column, minus 1, 1 becomes a column. Minus one is all there is. That row becomes, a, so this was, yeah, okay. So have I got it right? Yes. What's happened here? A transpose, what are the boundary conditions going with A transpose? The boundary conditions that went with A were, the, uh, yeah, uh, let me say first, what were the boundary conditions with A? Those are going to be boundary conditions on U. So, so A has boundary conditions on U. And A transpose has boundary conditions on W. Because A transpose acts on W and A acts on U. So it's, that's, there was no choice. So now what was the boundary condition here? The boundary condition was u4 equals 0, right? That was what I meant by that guy getting fixed. Now, and no boundary condition at, at u0. It was free. Now, what are the boundary conditions that go with A transpose? And remember, A transpose is multiplying w. I'm going to put w here. So what's, what are the boundary conditions that go with, with, with A transpose? This thing, nothing got knocked off. The boundary condition came up here for A transpose. The boundary condition was W, 0 equals 0. That, that got knocked out, W, 0 to be 0. No surprise, free fixed. This is the free end at the left. This is the fixed end at the right. It just, did you ever notice that the matrix does it for you? I mean, the but when you transpose that matrix, it just automatically built in the, the correct n boundary conditions on W by you started with the conditions on U, you transpose the matrix, and you discovered what the boundary conditions on W are. And I'm going to do the same for the, the uh, continuous problem. I'm going to do the same for the continuous problem. So the continuous, continuous free fix. Okay, what's the boundary condition on U? If it's free fix, I, I just want you to repeat this on the interval 0 to 1 for functions, U of x, W of x, instead of for vectors. What's the boundary condition on U if I have a free fixed problem? U of 1 equals 0. Right, U of 1 equals 0. What's the boundary condition? So this is the boundary condition that goes with A in the free fixed case. And what's the boundary, and, and this, this is part, maybe I say this, this is part of A. That, that, was, that, that is part of A. 
I don't know what A is until I know its boundary condition. Just the way I don't know what this matrix is. It could have been A naught, it could have lost one column, it could have lost two columns, whatever. I don't know until I've told you the boundary condition on U. And then transposing is going to tell me automatically, without any further input, the boundary condition that goes on the edge joint. So what's the boundary condition on W that goes with, that's part of A transpose? Well, you're going to tell me. Tell me. W of zero should be zero. Okay. It came out automatically, naturally. It, it, this is a big distinction between boundary conditions. This would be, I would call that an essential boundary condition. I, I push it, I had to start with it. I had to decide on that. And then this I call a natural boundary condition. Or there are even two guys' names who's, uh, which are associated with these two types. So maybe a good ch first chance to just mention these names. Because you'll often see in, in a r reading some paper, maybe on a m sort of uh, a little on the mathematical side to see the word used, uh, uh, the guy's name with this sort of boundary condition is a French name, not so easy to say, Dirichlet. I'll say it more often in the future. Anyway, that, I, I would call that a Dirichlet condition, and you would say it's a fixed boundary condition, and if you were doing heat flow, you would say it's a fixed temperature, whatever. Fixed is the, fixed is the, is really the word to remember there. Okay, and then I guess I better give Germany a shot here, too. Uh, so the boundary, the boundary condition, the, the natural boundary condition is associated with the name of Neumann. So if I said a Dirichlet problem, a, a, a total Dirichlet problem, I would be speaking about fixed, fixed. And if I spoke about a Neumann problem, I would be talking about free, free. And this problem is Dirichlet at one end, Neumann at the other. Anyway, so essential and, and natural. And now, of course, I guess I'm hoping that that's going to make this, that that is going to make this boundary term uh, go away. Ha. Ah. Okay, now I'm paying attention to this thing that you made me write. UW. Okay, what happens there? UW. Oh, all right. This, 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 this isn't bad because it shows that there's a boundary conditions have got some little deals going with them. Yeah. It, but do you see? Yeah. Uh, so do you see that that becomes zero? Why is it zero at the top end, at, at one? When I take u times w at one, why do I get zero? Because which one? U of 1 is 0. Good. And at the bottom end, when I take UW at the, at the other boundary, why do I get 0? Because of W. Do you see that W was needed? It, that, that W of 0 was needed because there was no controlling U of 0. I had no control of U at the left-hand end because it was free. So the, the control has to come from W. And so W naturally had to be zero because I wasn't controlling U at that left hand, free end. Yeah. So it's so one way or the other, the the uh, integration by parts is the key. Yeah. So uh, that that I'll I'll uh, so that said what I critically wanted to say about uh, transposing, taking the adjoint. Except I was just going to add a comment about this square A versus rectangular. Because that's, and this was a case of square, right? This was a case, this free fixed case, this example I happened to pick was square. A naught, the free free guy that was a hint on the quiz was rectangular. The fixed fixed, which was also on the quiz, was also rectangular, right? It was, what, four? Four by three or something. This is this a is four by four, and and what is what is especially nice when it's square? It just uh, uh, it just it, it, 
if our problem happens to give a square matrix. In the trust case, if the number of displacement unknowns happens to equal the number of bars, so M equals N, I have a square matrix A, and uh, this guy's invertible, so it's all good. You, oh, well, that's maybe the whole point. That if it's rectangular, I wouldn't talk about its inverse. But this is a square matrix, so I can, I, it has, A itself has an inverse. Instead of having, as I usually have, to deal with A transpose CA all, all at once, let me put this comment, because it's just a small one, uh, up here. Right under these words, square versus rectangular. Square A, and let's say invertible, Otherwise, we're in the unstable case. So you know what I mean. The number of, in the, in the network problems, the number of nodes equals the number of, uh, well, yeah, it, it matches the number of edges. In the, in the, uh, in the sp spring problem, we have a prefix situation. Anyway, A, A comes out square, whatever the application. If it, 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 if it comes out square, what is specially good? If it comes out square, what's specially good is that it has an inverse. So that in this square case, this K inverse, this A transpose C A inverse, can be split. Can is a, this, is, this allows us to separate, to do what you better not do otherwise, right? In other words, we, our three steps, which usually munch, mash together and we can't separate them and we have to deal with the whole matrix at once, in this square case, they do separate. And so that's just like worth noticing. It means that we can, it means that we can go, we can solve backwards, we can solve these three one at a time. The inverses can be done separately. When A or H and A transpose are square, then from this equation I can find W. From this, from knowing W, I can find E just by inverting C. By knowing E, I can find U just by inverting A. You see the three steps? You could invert that, then you can invert the middle step, then you can invert A, and you've got U. So the square case is like worth noticing. It's special enough that I in this case, uh, we would have an easy problem, and this case is called, in the, for, for trusses and mechanics, is called, there's a name for this, and unfortunately it's a little long, statically, that's not the key word, determinate is the key word. Statically determinate. That, that goes with square. And you can guess what the rectangular matrix A, what word would I use? What's the opposite of determinate? It's got to be indeterminate. Rectangular A will be indeterminate. And, and all, I mean, all that is referring to is the fact that in the determinate case, the forces determine the stresses. Just, you don't have to take out, get the whole, all three together, mix them in, invert, go backwards, all that. You just can do them one at a time in this determinant case. So I'm just, oh, and, and now I guess I better say, uh, so here's the matrix case, but now in this chapter I always have to do the, the continuous part. So what would be, so let me s stay with free fix, and what's this, what is this balance equation? So this is, my this is my force balance. I, I, didn't, I didn't give it a, it's moment, but it's moment has come now. So the force balance equation is minus dw dx, because A transpose is minus a derivative equal f of x. And my, my free boundary condition, my free end, gave me w of, what was it? The, the Neumann guy gave me W of 0 equals 0. And what's the point? Do, do, you, do you see what I'm saying? I'm saying that this free fix 
is a beautiful example of determinant. Square matrix A in the matrix case and the parallel in the continuous case is what? I can solve that for W of X. I can solve directly for W of X. Without involving, you see, I didn't have to know C of X. I didn't even, I don't, I haven't even got that far. I'm just going backwards now. I can solve this just, just the way I can invert uh, that matrix. Inverting the matrix here is the same as solving the equation. You, you see I have a first order, first derivative, I mean it's a trivial equation, right? It's the equation you solved in the final problem of the quiz where an f was a delta function. It was simple because it was a square determinant problem with one condition on w. When both conditions are on u, then, then you've, you've got to, it's not square anymore. Okay for that point? Determinant versus indeterminate. Okay. So that's, uh, that's sort of, and I could do examples, you know, I could, maybe I've asked you on the homework to take a particular f of x. I hope it was a free fixed problem if I was feeling good that day because free fixed, you'll be able to get w of x right away. If it was fixed fixed, then I apologize, it's going to take you a little bit longer to get to w, to, to get to u, yeah. Okay, but this of course, one, in, I mean, I just integrate. Inverting a difference matrix is just integrating a function. Okay, so there, there, that's, these are sort of, this, this lecture so far was the transition from vectors and matrices to functions and continuous problems. And then, of course, we're going to get deep into that because we've got partial differential equations ahead. But today, let's stay in one dimension and introduce finite elements. Okay. Ready for finite elements. So that's now a, a major step. Finite differences, uh, I, I, uh, maybe I'll mention this probably in this afternoon's review session uh, where I'll just be open to homework problems. I'll say something more about trust examples and I might say something about finite differences for this. But really it's finite elements that, that get introduced right now. So let me do that. Okay. Finite elements get introduced now. Okay. Okay. So the prep, the, the, the getting ready for finite elements is to get hold of something called the weak form of the equation. Of the, uh, of the equation. So that's going to be a, a continuous a statement of the, uh, the uh, finite elements aren't appearing yet. Just matrices are not appearing yet. I'm talking about the differential equation. But what, is it, what do I mean by this weak form? Okay, let me just go, go for it directly. You see the equation up there? Let me copy it. So here's the strong form. The strong form is the, you would say, is the ordinary equation. The strong form is, is what our equation is, minus d by dx of c of x du dx equal f of x. Okay, that's the strong form. That's the equation. Now, how do I get to the weak form? Let me, let me just go to it directly and then we'll over uh, the next days we'll see why it's so natural and important. If I go for it directly, what I do is this. I multiply both sides of the equation by something I'll call a test function. And I'll try to systematically use the letter V for the test function. U will be a uh, um, solution. V isn't the solution. V is like any function. That I, that I test this equation this way. 
I'm just multiplying both sides by the same thing, v, some v of x, any v of x. We'll see if there are any limitations, okay? And I integrate. Dx. Okay. So you're going to say, no, no problem. I integrate from 0 to 1. All right. So this is like, um, uh, this would be true for, f so, so, the we so now I, I'll erase the word strong form because the strong form isn't on the board anymore. It's the weak form now that we're looking at. And this is for any via, for any, and I'll put any in quotes just because there's, I, I have, I have to, I'll, eventually I'll say a little more about this. For any, I, I'll write the equation this way. And, and you might think, okay, if I test, if I, if this has to hold for every v of x, yeah, I, mean, I could like let v of x be concentrated in a little area. And, and this would have to hold, then I could try another V of X concentrated at, around other points. You can maybe feel that if this holds for every V of X, then I can get back to the strong form. If this holds for, for every V of X, then somehow that had better be the same as that. Because if this was F of X, if this was F of X plus one, and this is F of X, then I'd, I wouldn't have the equality anymore. Uh, shall I just say that again? It's just like, uh, at this point, it's just a feeling that if this is true for every v of x, then that part had better equal that part. I'll have a way, that'll be my way back to the strong form. It's a little bit like climbing a hill. Going downhill was easy. I just multiplied by v and integrated. Nobody objected to that. I'm saying I'll be able to get back to the strong form uh, with a little patience. But I like the weak form. That's the whole point. You've got to begin to like the weak form. You, you begin to take it in and think, okay, now why do I like it? What am I going to do to that left side? The right side's cool, right? It looks good. Left side does not look good to me. When you see something like that, what is what do you think? Our, our, today's lecture has already said what to think. What should I do to make that look better? I should, yep, integrate by parts. If I integrate by parts, you see what I don't like about this about it as it is is two derivatives are hitting u, and nobody, and v is by itself, and I want it to be symmetric. So my I'm going to integrate this by parts. This is minus the derivative of something times, times v. And when I integrate by parts, I'm going to have, it'll be an integral. And what, so can you integrate by parts now? I mean, this is like, you probably haven't thought about integration by parts for a while. Just think of it as taking the derivative off of this, so it leaves that by itself, and putting it onto v, so it bring, so it's dv dx, and remembering the minus sign, but we have a minus sign, so now it's coming out plus. That's the weak form. Can I, can I put a circle around the weak form? Well, no, it wasn't exactly a circle. Okay. <laughs> but that's the weak form. For every v, this is, I could give you a physical interpretation, but I won't, I won't, uh, do it just this minute. This is, this is going to hold for any, for any v. That's the weak form. Okay, good. Now, why do I want to, why did I want to do that? Oh, the person who reminds me about boundary conditions should remind me again that when I did this integration by parts, there should have been also, uh, what's, the, what's the integrated part now that's, that has to be evaluated at 0 and 1? C, so it's, it's that times that, right? It's the C of x du dx times V of x. 
Uh, maybe minor. Yeah, you're right, minor. Good. What do I want this to come out? Zero, of course. I, well, I don't want to think about this anymore. All right. So now I'm doing this free fixed problem still. So what's the deal on the free fixed problem? Oh, huh. Well, let's see. Okay, I got the two ends, and I want them, but I want them to be zero. Okay, now at at the free end, at the free end, this had better. At the free end, I'm not controlling v. I'm not, I'm not, I wasn't controlling u, and I'm not going to be controlling its friend v. So this had to be had to be zero. So this part <laughs> will be zero at the free end. That, that boundary condition has just appeared again naturally. I had to have it because I had no control over V. And what about at the fixed end? At the fixed end, which is that? Uh, yeah, yeah, this is at the free end. Now, what's, what's up at the fixed end? The fi what was the fixed end? That's where U was zero. I'm going to make V also zero. So there's, when I said any v of x, I better put in with v equals 0 at the fixed, at, 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 at Dirichlet point, at fixed point, at fixed end. That, I need that. I need to know that v is 0 at that, at that end. I, need, I had u equals 0. Here's why I, here's why I'm, I'm fine. So I'm saying that any time I have a Dirichlet condition, a fixed condition that tells me u, I think of v, and you'll begin to think of v, as a little movement away from u. As a little movement, uh, v is, you know, u is some, is some, uh, po some uh, is the solution. Now remember, uh, remind me, this was free fixed, so it, the, the u might have been Something like this, right? I, I'll just draw that, right? That, that's my u. This guy was fixed, right, by u. Now, I'm thinking of v's as the word v, uh, letter v is very fortunate because it stands for virtual displacement. A virtual displacement is a little displacement away from u, but it has to satisfy the zero, the fixed condition that u satisfies. In other words, the little virtual v can't move away from zero. So I get, I get this term is zero at the fixed end. Okay. So I've, I, I, th that's the little five-minute timeout to, to check the boundary condition part. The net result is that that term's gone, and I've got the the um, weak form as I want it. Okay, three minutes to tell you, to start to tell you the, how to use the weak form. Okay, so this is called Galerkin's idea, Galerkin method, Galerkin's method. And it starts with the weak form. So he's Russian. We, Russia gets in, into the picture now. We had France and Germany with the boundary conditions. Now we've got Russia with this fundamental principle of how to turn a continuous problem into a discrete problem. That's what Galerkin's idea does. Instead of a function unknown, I want to have n unknowns. I want to I get a discrete equation, which will eventually be ku equal f. So I'm going to get to an equation k u equal f, but not by finite differences, right? I could, but I'm not. I'm doing it this weak Galerkin finite element way. Okay, so if I tell you the Galerkin idea, then, then next time we bring in, we have libraries of finite elements, but you have to get the principle straight. So it's Galerkin's idea. Galerkin's idea was choose, 
trial functions, let me call them u1, no, no, I won't call them u, what do I call them? T, oh my God, I have to get their names right, oh, um, phi, phi. Okay, the Greeks get a shot here. Okay, trial functions, <laughs> phi 1 of x up to phi n of x. Okay, so that's, that's a choice you make, and, you, and you ha we have a free choice, and it's a fundamental choice through all of applied math. You, you choose some functions, and if you choose them well, you get a great method. If you choose them badly, you get a lousy method. Okay, so you choose trial functions, and now what's the idea going to be? You're going to be your approximate, approximate u, approximate solution, will be some combination of them. So combinations of those. Oh, let me call the, let me call the coefficients u's because those are the unknowns. Plus u n phi n. So those are the unknowns. The n unknowns. The n, th 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 that's my, yeah, I, I'll, I'll even, yeah, I'll even remove that for the moment. Well, I, no, I should leave it. You see, these are functions of x, and these are numbers. So our unknown, our unknown, our n unknown numbers are the coefficients to be decided of the functions we chose. Okay, now I need n equations. I've got n unknowns now. They're the unknown coefficients of these functions. I need n equations, so I get n equations by choose test functions, v1, v2, up to vn. Each v will give me an equation, so I'll have n equations at the end. I have n unknowns. I'll have a square matrix. And that'll be, and I'll write it as a, it'll be a linear system. I'll get to KU equal F. But do you see how I'm getting there? I'm getting there by using the weak form, by using Galerkin's idea of picking some trial functions and some test functions and putting them into the weak form. So Galerkin's idea is take these functions and these functions and apply the weak form just to those guys. Not to the real weak form, the continuous weak form was for all, a whole lot of v's. We'll get n equations by picking n v's and we'll get n unknowns by picking n phi's. And the point now, so this method, this idea was a hundred years older than finite element. The finite element idea was a particular choice of these guys a particular choice of the phi's and the v's as simple polynomials. And you might think, well, why didn't Galerkin try those first? Maybe he did. But the, the, the key is that now with, with uh, the computing power we now have compared to Galerkin, we can choose thousands of functions if we keep them simple. So that, that's really what's, what, what the finite element brought, finite element method brought is keep the functions as simple polynomials and take many of them. Where Galerkin, who didn't have MATLAB or even a, even a, probably he didn't even have a desk computer, he was pencil and paper, he took one function or maybe two. I mean, like that took him a day. So, so now, but we take thousands of functions simple functions, and, and we'll see on Friday the steps that get us to KU equal F. So this is the prep for finite elements.